Okay, so hello and uh, welcome. It's a real pleasure to be joining you for Glasgow Science Centre's Our World, Our Impact programme today. I'm going to be speaking to you about the three S's of climate change. The science is simple, the impact is serious, but most importantly, this problem is solvable. So let's start by getting a few basics out of the way. It's happening and it's us. This is one depiction of our changing climate over the last 160 years. Each one of these stripes represents a single year and the global average temperature. Cold years are shown in blue, warmer years are shown in red. And you can see this striking pattern of a warming climate as we get into the latter part of the 20th century. Here's another depiction of that data on a more conventional graph, but making the point that across all of the world's different agencies that keep track of our planet's climate, they all agree our world is getting warmer. Now, you will find people out there who make the extraordinary claim that they don't believe in thermometers. So we can look at other signs of a changing climate too. And here is one of the more dramatic. These are two photos taken from the same place in Alaska, the one on the left in 1941, the one on the right in 2004. And of course, the major difference is the complete meltback of this enormous glacier. This is a pattern that is being seen the world over as our planet warms. It's happening and it is us. Overwhelmingly, it is because we are burning coal, oil and gas and that produces CO2. And CO2 has a warming, blanketing effect on our planet. And to dig into the nitty gritty of how that works, the science of the greenhouse effect, we're going to uh, do this but through the medium of dance. I'd like everyone, if you're watching at home, to stand up, limber up, and join me in dancing the greenhouse effect. So, the energy that powers our climate system comes to Earth from the sun, and it comes in the form of bouncing waves of solar radiation. So I want everyone to be your best bouncing wave of solar radiation. Now, that incoming solar energy, it bounces, it collides with the Earth, and it makes the atoms of Earth jiggle around faster. And that is the literal physical definition of heat energy. It's the bouncing around speed of atoms. And so those bouncing around atoms, they then start radiating too. Anything that has some bounce to it can radiate. But because Earth is colder than the sun, it has a kind of cooler, kind of radiation known as infrared. Now, if that was it, if this was all that there was in our climate system, energy coming in from the sun and then leaving planet Earth, we would be a rather chilly minus 15 or minus 20 degrees or so. We'd be a frozen ball of ice in the middle of space. And so way back in 1824, Joseph Furrier pointed out that there must be something else that's important in our climate system. And he suggested the idea for the first time of a greenhouse effect. So how does this work? Well, a few years later in 1859, John Tyndall pointed out the heat trapping properties of CO2. So CO2 is a greenhouse gas and it also has its own dance move. So CO2 has a couple of different dance moves. It vibrates either like this or like this. So be your best CO2 molecule vibrating in the atmosphere. Now, CO2 doesn't think very much of that frantic visible light coming in from the sun, but it quite likes the cooler moves of the infrared radiation leaving planet Earth. And so that CO2 molecule decides to interact with that outgoing infrared radiation, it absorbs that radiation, it bounces faster, and then it can re-radiate that energy back down to the surface of our planet, where the surface atoms of our planet get another chance to absorb that energy, and they can bounce faster. They then radiate that infrared back out into the atmosphere, where the CO2 can absorb it again and re-radiate it back down to Earth. And so, while a little bit of CO2 in our atmosphere is a good thing, 
It's allowed to, us to have liquid water at the surface of our planet. It's allowed life to flourish. The more CO2 you add to the atmosphere, the harder and harder it gets for infrared energy to escape to space. And so our planet warms up and warms up and warms up. And the first person to point this out was Fonte Arenas way back in 1896. That's how long we've known that adding CO2 to the atmosphere would warm our climate. And this is something that there is overwhelming scientific consensus on. So how much CO2 have we added? Just how big of a deal is this? Has climate not changed before? These are the kinds of questions that I love digging into as a climate scientist and a geologist. And so I like looking back through Earth's climate history in archives like this one. This is a tube of ice from Antarctica. Each layer in that ice represents a year. So we can read back through the history of climate, like reading through the pages of a book. And when we look in real close detail, like we're showing in this zoomed in image here, at that ice, you can see it contains lots of tiny wee bubbles. These are bubbles of our ancient atmosphere. This is our atmosphere's fossil record. And so by looking at the composition of those bubbles, we can look at the composition of our ancient atmosphere and how it changed through time. So that's what I'm gonna show you here. Time is gonna go from left to right, from 800,000 years ago to the present day. And CO2 concentration is on the y-axis going from 150 ppm, that's parts per million in the atmosphere. It's like if I took a million molecules in the atmosphere, 150 of them would be CO2 down here, 250 of them would be CO2 here. And so, as we look at this uh, record of CO2 in the atmosphere, we see these regular periodic changes. We have low values of about 180 ppm, and these are associated with great ice ages. Here in Scotland, that's a kilometre of ice on top of where I'm standing right now. At the end of an ice age, CO2 rises to about 280 ppm. And that involves the melting back of that kilometer's worth of ice sheets and a rise in sea level of 120 meters. Now let's look at what's happened in the last 100 years. So CO2 today is 413 ppm. This is way above anything in that ice core record. What's more, it's happened a hundred times faster. And Earth's climate system is just starting to feel the impact of that blanketing layer of CO2 in our atmosphere. So the impacts of climate change are serious and we can see them in a variety of different ways. Most strikingly, perhaps warming temperatures. These data here from NASA, showing planetary temperatures and how they have changed over the last 100 years. You can see warmer temperatures shown in red, colder in blue. And strikingly, as we go through the 20th century, it gets warmer and warmer and warmer. So already today, our global temperatures are about one degree C warmer than they were pre-industrially. And to some of you, that might not sound like a very big number, but bear in mind that the peak of the last ice age was actually only five degrees colder. And that was a world with a kilometer of ice on top of where I am now and sea level 120 meters lower. So five degrees C, that's an enormous, enormous ice age style climate change. And we're already one degree C, that's like 20% of an ice age sized climate change. What's more, in some places, it's got way warmer than one degree C already. In particular, at high latitudes up in the Arctic, we can see some places it's warmed by almost four degrees C, which is the same as the annual temperature difference between Scotland and Paris. Now, we care about a warming climate not just because of temperature itself, but because of all of the impacts that rising temperatures have to things that we deeply care about. Now, I don't want 
to spend too long on these climate impacts because they are just too sad. They impact people's lives and they impact people's lives here and now. This is not something that is confined to polar bears in the Arctic and to a hundred years time. This is something that we are already seeing today, whether that is hurricanes in the southern states of the US and the Caribbean, melting ice in Antarctica, wildfires in Australia and California, as the world gets warmer and drier, fires get more likely. But that water that's been evaporated out of the dry places, it falls in the wet places. And unfortunately, Scotland counts as one of those wet places. And so in the UK, we have seen increased flooding year on year. We have melting permafrost in the Arctic, bleaching coral reefs in the tropics and crop failures in a bunch of worlds that can, a uh, bunch of places that cannot afford to have a further hit to how they get their food. Overwhelmingly, these aren't environmental problems. We don't need to save the planet. These are problems that affect people's lives. They affect people's lives right here and right now. Each one of these is a human catastrophe. So what's the good news? Well, the very best thing that I can tell you about climate change is that we know how to fix it. And we know that with every CO2 atom that we don't have in the atmosphere, each of these impacts gets less and less scary. And this is really important as we think about our planet into the future. Why should we care about our planets in the future? Do we care about it because of some kind of sense of wanting to save the planet? Maybe. But for me, the reason I care about the planet's future most is because of this guy. This is my toddler, John. He's two years old, born in 2018, into a planet that was already one degree C warmer. What will the climate that he grows up in look like. For him, the year 2100 isn't some projection in a climate model. This will be part of his lived reality. The future may be uncertain. We can't predict all of the impacts of climate change, but we are sending our kids into that uncertain future. And I think we've got a duty to do our very best to make it as safe as we possibly can them. So the good news, this problem is solvable and as we start thinking about that I want to begin with an analogy about another incredible thing that we as humans have done. So let's think for a second about what powers not our climate system or our society but what powers us, what powers our metabolisms which is to say, where does our food come from? So casting our minds back again into geological history, at the end of the last ice age, there was only a few million humans on the planet. And yet with that few million humans hunting woolly mammoths, we had already driven them to extinction. Then at the end of the ice age, as climate starts to stabilize, we invented a revolutionary new technology. And that technology is called farming. Farming is a technology because it takes human ingenuity and it allows us to grow food from sunlight, from rainwater, and from things we know how to do, like planting seeds. And it allows us to do it again and again and again and again. And this has ultimately allowed us to feed the 7 billion people on the planet today. Now, when it comes to our energy, we have largely still been in that hunter-gatherer mode. We go out, we find coal and oil and gas, we dig it up, we burn it, and it's done. And we need to make the same kind of revolution that we made for our food, for our energy systems, to instead of digging up fuels, using technologies to farm our energy from the sun, from wind, and rainwater again and again and again. 
And so here is the good news about climate change. This problem is solving and it is happening. We are living in an incredibly exciting time. The cost of renewables is plunging year on year on year. Solar panels are 200 times cheaper than they were 40 years ago, and that cost keeps falling. So the cheapest way you can possibly get electricity today is by wind and solar. As a result, uptake increases and increases and increases. So this is the total installed capacity of renewable electricity right here in Scotland. And you can see it's tripled in the last 10 years. Now, I'd love to be able to say that this was solar. That's not something that jives particularly well with the Scotland's climate, but a rare advantage of our climate is its windiness. And so wind energy here is doing amazing things for how we get our electricity. So that today, three quarters of Scotland's electricity comes from clean sources. And this creates over 5 billion turnover in our economy, and it creates huge numbers of jobs. This isn't just the case in Scotland. This is a pattern that we are seeing around the world. So this on the left shows coal versus renewable energy consumption in America. And you can see that this year for the first time, renewables overtook coal. And globally around the world, again, this year, renewables became the number one source of how we get electricity. And this continues to change. So even the plans that India had for building coal-fired power stations in 2019, by 2020, 84% of that planned increase in coal has been shelved because it no longer makes sense. And it's working. So this is an amazing success story that I don't think enough people know about. This graph shows you the UK's CO2 emissions over the last 170 years. And you can see that our CO2 emissions have fallen to levels that were last seen way back in 1888. There has been an enormous drop in the emissions of CO2 due to a combination of cleaner electricity, but also energy efficiency. All of those things that you guys have done, like change your light bulbs and think about the insulation of your houses, these have really made a difference. So, job done? Well, unfortunately not. We need to keep charging towards this renewable world. And this is, I think, neatly shown by this figure here, which shows the breakdown of where greenhouse gases come from. Electricity, accounts for a big chunk, but only actually about a quarter of where CO2 and other greenhouse gases come from. There's also a huge contribution from changes in land use and agriculture. The chopping down of tropical forests to make space for cows. This is something that is happening on an absolutely enormous scale. Consider that the wildlife that is grown for slaughter outweighs all of natural wildlife by a factor of 15. But there is good news in here as well. Essentially, the easiest way to change our CO2 emissions globally is to clean up our electricity and for these sectors here to make as many of them electric as we possibly can. And there are some surprising and amazing and easy wins here. So, for instance, about 10% of global emissions come from just digging up fossil fuels before you've even burnt them to get energy. So what we need to do is make as much clean electricity as we possibly can and then turn everything that we can into electric versions. This is why it is so exciting that we are making electric cars. I just ordered one and you can get a loan from the Scottish government that is interest free to do this and it feels like a spaceship. And there is more good news when we look at this because the efficiency of things like electric cars is so much better than their fossil fuel alternatives 
that a 100% renewable electric world actually needs only about half of the electricity and energy that the current equivalent does. So what can I do? How can we charge forward into this better future? Well, we all have to find the things that will work for us, but I wanted to share with you guys some of the things that have worked for me and for our family. These, to us, just seemed like easy wins. So we've switched our energy supplier to a green energy supplier. So now our electricity comes from renewable sources and our gas is produced cleanly as well. We also eat more plants and less meat. What does that look like? Does it look like no more of these? Well, no, this amazing burger here in this picture is actually a completely vegetarian burger. You can make amazing vegetarian food. There are great alternatives, but I'm not saying that everyone has to go fully vegetarian. The impact of just eating a bit less meat is also enormous. Almost 80% the impact of going fully vegetarian can be had by just having only one portion of dairy a day and red meat only once per week. And that is something that still allows you to have the occasional bacon sandwich, but at the same time does your bit for the planet and for our future generations. There are other easy wins too. Insulate your house, reduce food waste, take the train wherever possible, avoid flying whenever you can. And like I mentioned, there is the opportunity now to get really exciting electric cars. And there's support for a bunch of these initiatives right here, right now through the Energy Saving Trust. Most importantly, in, uh, in Scotland, at least for, for me, most of these changes will save you money. But finally, making these individual changes is good, it's a step in the right direction, and they do all add up, but we do also need to do more. And so finally, the most important, and in some ways the easiest thing that we can do about climate change, is talk about it is demand climate solutions, is demand a better future. And this is something that has been happening amazingly thanks to our young people today. But we cannot let them shoulder the burden. So let's please all just think about how we can continue this conversation. It is the easiest part of conservation. Talk to your friends and family about climate impacts and solutions. Amplify your voice by joining one of these larger groups and think, who else can I influence? My bank? Where is my pension invested? What could we do around my workplace or in one of the community groups that I'm part of? Most importantly, put pressure on our politicians. We still subsidize the fossil fuel industry with enormous tax breaks. Support renewables instead. And in particular, as this COVID crisis comes to an end, let's grow back greener. And we really can make a difference. This is shown just so dramatically by considering these images at the bottom. This on the left is Greta Thunberg in 2018. She was a 15 year old that nobody had heard of. Over the last two years, her and an enormous groundswell, an enormous movement of young people have completely changed our conversation globally about what we do about climate change. And we are seeing across all places and across the political spectrum, an enormous advance in support for a better future. And so it's been a real pleasure to chat to you today. Let's all focus on the simple, serious and solvable aspects of climate change. And let's in particular do that right here in Scotland ahead of the UN Climate Summit that is going to happen right here in Glasgow next year. In the build up to that, keep an eye on what the Glasgow Science Centre is doing. They're coordinating public efforts and outreach, and they'd be really happy to involve you in the activities that they're arranging. I'll also be doing various bits and pieces. And in the first instance, I'll be really happy to take any of your questions, uh, please just pop them into uh, the chat wherever you've been watching this video and I'll answer them next week. And you can use the hashtag our world, our impact.
Thank you very much for watching.